I've travelled here to Valencia in Spain to meet arguably one of the most important and controversial figures of science in our generation. I am talking about J. Craig Venter. From initial studies looking at the way that neurotransmitters work in the brain, he moved on to an interest in genetics and then genomics. It was a career path that was to lead him in the year 2000 to the White House, where he shared the praise for one of the greatest undertakings in human history, the sequencing of the human genome, unlocking our own genetic blueprint. Despite an undistinguished background as a student, he has become one of the most famous geneticists of the early 21st century. Your autobiography, A Life Decoded, and one of the stories in it which intrigued me was how you got into medicine and then into genetic research, and that came out of your experiences in Vietnam. Well, I did uh, very poorly in school and uh, left uh, school uh, at age 17 to take up a surfing career, uh, but uh, uh, interrupted uh, very abruptly by being drafted into the military because right. this was uh, uh, at the start of the Vietnam War. Yeah. Uh, and I ended up being a medic in Vietnam uh, and it transformed my life. You know, I saw the value of education, I saw the value of knowledge. Uh, the more knowledge I had, the more lives I could save. That led to uh, wanting to go into medicine, uh, then actually changing, uh, being really excited about science. One of the things that comes out very strongly in your autobiography is that you are an innovator in the field of genomics. And I think perhaps the most influential technology that you developed was shotgun sequencing of DNA. How does that differ to what they were doing before? Well, everybody thought uh, genomes were too large to be tackled uh, as a whole. Uh, so it was envisioned to break them into thousands or tens of thousands of smaller projects and distribute them around a country, around the world. Uh, for example, the yeast genome uh, uh, was one of the first uh, projects funded by governments it took over a thousand scientists to, over 10 years to do that genome. And we reduced that 10 years and a thousand scientists to four months and a handful of people. And I mean, I think the original budget for the, the human genome project, which you were heavily involved in, the old, the old way was $3 billion. That was just the U.S. budget. Uh, right. The U.K. spent at least another billion. Uh, we did it in nine months for a hundred million, which is still a lot of money, but uh, Compared to five billion, that's a pittance. And you, you did that via sort of the, uh, the private route, and I found that very, very interesting. And I, I noticed also in your autobiography, one of the things that you said is that when you set up um, your various institutes, Tiger and Silera and all the rest of it, the two things that you insisted upon was no tenure, and you wouldn't allocate funding uh, you wouldn't allocate space on the, on the basis of funding. Yeah. And this is still very common in the United Kingdom, certainly in the tertiary education sector. Yeah. Uh, but what made you go down that route? Well, I, it, it's still very, uh, it's the standard in uh, most American universities as well. It's, uh, you know, tenure used to be something that protected uh, uh, risk takers. Uh, now it seems to be something that protects mediocrity. And so the whole purpose of it has gone away. And uh, in science, uh, your tenure should be the quality of the work you do. Uh, and so even uh, Nobel laureates like Ham Smith don't have tenure. Uh, we're all at will employees. I don't have a contract uh, even with my own organization uh, because it's the quality, you know, when people do world-class research, uh, that's better uh, job uh, security uh, than any contract you could have with somebody. When you went over towards private funding, that came with its own sort of set of problems as well. It wasn't like somebody just said, as you, I think, yeah. had hoped, correct me if I'm wrong, Craig, you know, here is the money, just please go get on with it. How, how was that to work in that? Yeah, there's definitely no part? free lunch in the world. <laughs> and, <laughs> uh, you know, uh, everybody wants something uh, for their money. The, that, you know, the foundations and governments want credit, that, you know, the businessmen 
want credit and control. Um, you know, so there's trade-offs with every approach, but I think it is pretty extraordinary that private investment money went into the biggest public project ever, made the human sequence available to the world uh, for free. I mean, that's pretty extraordinary. In fact, it turns out private industry does things like this not infrequently. Uh, academics like to think they're the only ones that uh, do anything in that vein. Uh, and quite often they block money that goes to innovation. So it's, uh, fortunately there are, all, are occasionally alternatives for some of us to follow. Do you think that, that is your favored approach for the future of science funding? Well, all the breakthroughs that my teams and I have made have been because we had independent money to pursue it. It didn't matter whether it was uh, uh, ESTs, uh, the first genomes in history that we did, the human genome, what we've done with the environment and now what we're doing with synthetic genomics, all of those started uh, with some independent resources to prove the idea work. Once you prove an idea works, it's easier to get government funding, ironically. Yeah. Yeah. So I think I've been fortunate in finding ways to get money to do those pilot experiments to prove that the ideas work. I, I like to convince people by having the experimental data, not by making arguments. So you left Celera after the Human Genome Project mm -hmm. was completed and, and you went to the ocean, which is your other passion, mm -hmm. I think, on your yacht Sorcerer 2. And it's like a step up in scale, isn't it? Yeah. Here is the human genome, now we're going to sequence the planet. I mean, what was your thinking behind that? Well, we knew that the techniques that we had, the mathematics was able of solving multiple genomic equations simultaneously. At the same time, trying to look around after doing the human genome, uh, uh, myself and my team with Ham Smith and others, obviously we established a certain amount of scientific credibility and right. we had the choice to work on whatever we wanted to work on. And uh, I felt and we felt that what we're doing to our environment uh, is the most pressing issue facing humanity. Uh, we can't keep doing what we're doing, so we thought maybe our tools would enable us to have a better understanding of the environment uh, and even lead to new discoveries how to protect it better. How do you see the discoveries that you are making with synthetic genomics actually mapping onto solving environmental problems? Well, the biggest problem we have is the CO2 building up in the atmosphere, primarily from burning oil and coal. So we're taking ancient carbon out of the ground, we're burning it and it ends up in our atmosphere. I mean, here we're sitting in this beautiful setting. If things continue the way they go, this will be underwater in the future. With climate change, it's just not a matter of places getting warmer. We're already having food shortages in the world. So this is not an option. I mean, humanity can keep going down this track and slowly uh, destroy itself or we can use the tools of modern science to try and change uh, the, the, the problem. And so we're trying to use biology to come up with new sources of fuel so we can have replacements for oil and coal on a renewable basis. So is that like moving to a hydrogen economy or, or something different? I think uh, it's unlikely we'll get to a hydrogen economy, but uh, I think we'll be in a CO2 economy. We can take the carbon from carbon dioxide and convert it into fuels. I mean, that's what plants do with photosynthesis. Yeah. They convert the CO2 into sugar, uh, which you can then burn, but we're trying to make it much more efficient going right from CO2 into fuel production. If we can do that, then we have a renewable source. You are obviously most well known for your work in the Human Genome Project, but something that you did recently has uh, hit the headlines, which is the development of a synthetic chromosome mm -hmm. from raw laboratory chemical. Do you see that as part and parcel of your vision for applying genomic science to environmental problems, the ability to create uh, this it, kind of life? It's the tool set that will be used by tens of thousands of scientists to uh, solve all kinds of problems, uh, n not just the uh, fuel problem, uh, but the entire petrochemical industry is based on taking oil as the raw material, yeah. uh, making clothing, carpet, plastics. Uh, there's the potential to replace that entire industry 
uh, starting with sugar, starting with carbon dioxide, yeah. using biology to drive these processes. The ability to now write the genetic code allows us to harness uh, this power uh, in a very thoughtful fashion to change metabolisms of cells to do these processes in very efficient ways. People will ask Craig Venter, what's next? I think what's next is trying to put these ideas into action. Um, uh, it's an idea right now that this is the century of biology. We need to prove it's the century of biology by having biology really contribute to these solutions, not just the discussion of them. So uh, that's the challenge facing all of us right now is uh, coming up with uh, fuels based on biology that really make a difference coming up with new medicines, coming up with uh, uh, new sources of food. Uh, if that happens, uh, I think the world uh, will be a different place. Craig Venter, thank you very much indeed. Nice talking to you.